Hello everybody, a slightly different virtual planetarium for you this month as uh, due to the ongoing uh, situation with the coronavirus, uh, Paul and myself are unable to get together to record at the same time. So uh, this month you've just got me, I'm afraid. The big bonus of that, of course, is that I will be able to uh, get a word in without being interrupted. But hopefully, if everything sorts itself out, we'll be back together uh, fairly soon. OK, let's start, as we always do, uh, with the solar system. And Mercury reaches superior conjunction on the 4th of May, after which time it'll re-emerge into the evening sky. And it does so this month in a really spectacular fashion, because it'll be really well placed after sunset, appearing quite bright. On the 9th of May, it shines at around magnitude minus 1.7, which is pretty good for Mercury, and it sets about 40 minutes after the sun. So that gives you a good opportunity to see it, so long as you've got a good horizon uh, over towards the, the northwest. If it's nice and flat, and the sun has gone down, the sky starts to get dark, because it's so bright, it should come out relatively quickly for you. Now, there's an easier way to see Mercury because on the 21st and the 22nd of May, Mercury will appear close to Venus and Venus will act as a convenient guide. Now, if you've been seeing Venus in the evening sky over uh, previous weeks, you'll think oh, that's going to be really easy. But actually, it's not going to be quite as easy as you may think. And the reason for that is simply that Venus is now heading towards uh, inferior conjunction. That's when it will pass between us and the Sun. And that occurs on the 3rd of June. So as you get towards the end of May, then Venus will be quite low down after the Sun has set. So don't get complacent with it. It should still be quite bright though, Venus, so it should be uh, easy to pick out. And as I say, on the 21st and 22nd of May, Mercury and Venus will appear quite close together. Now Mercury appears at magnitude minus 0.6 on the 21st of May and it's separated from a really bright Venus, Venus is about minus 4.1, by about 1.4 degrees. So that's, what's that? That's about three times the apparent diameter of the full moon. On the 22nd of May, Mercury, which will be getting slightly dimmer, but only by a tiny amount, it's magnitude minus 0.5 on the 22nd, is 1.3 degrees from Venus. So actually slightly closer, but it's not going to be very much. So those are two good nights to actually look out for it. Mercury continues to dim throughout the month, but its position remains very favourable. And a telescopic view of Mercury on the 9th of May will reveal a tiny five arc second disk. Uh, which is a, almost fully lit, actually. It's about 97% illumination. On the 22nd of May, when it has its close encounter with Venus, it appears six arc seconds across and 67% lit. So it's approached it's in a gibbous phase at that time, but it's still quite small. By the end of the month, Mercury appears seven arc seconds across and 45% lit. So that's getting just less than half lit, so it'll be in its crescent phase at that point. On the 23rd of May, a very slender 1% lit illuminated waxing crescent moon will sit 6.3 degrees to the south of Venus and Mercury. Uh, the moon sets about an hour after the sun, so it's going to be a tough spot to see that against the bright evening twilight, but still quite an interesting view if you can get it, and it'll make an interesting photograph if you can take a shot of it. If you don't get it on the 23rd, there is a better opportunity to see the moon, because it'll be 4% lit at that time, uh, and it will be lying 5 degrees to the southeast of Mercury, which will be about mi mag minus 0.3 at that time. So from the UK, that places the moon to the left of Mercury. Okay, let's head out to uh, Venus then. And Venus, um, this is the last month really to get a good view of Venus in the evening sky for this period of observability. Now it's going to be fairly obvious where it is at the beginning of the month, but as I said just now, as we get towards the end of May, it's going to start to get quite tricky to see. At the start of May, Venus appears to shine at mag minus 4.4, and it sets almost four hours after the Sun. Through the eyepiece, it presents a 39 arc second disk, 
which is a beautiful crescent at the beginning of May. It's 24% illuminated. And if you've never seen the crescent of Venus before, this is a good time to do it. So if you've got a telescope, get a telescope on it. If you haven't got your own telescope and it's we're allowed to go out to uh, astronomical societies at that time, then maybe you can get a view of it through an astronomical society telescope. The light evenings in May will only allow Venus to appear one and a half hours against a truly dark sky at the beginning of the month. By the end of the month, Venus appears to shine at mag minus 3.7, so it's got a little bit dimmer and sets 30 minutes after sunset. That's quite a difference from the four hours we had at the start of May. Through a telescope at the end of May, it will appear almost an arc minute across, but just a delicate slender crescent, less than 1% illuminated on the 31st of May. That is an incredible sight if you can get to see it. So we'll lose Venus after that as it heads towards the sun and uh, we have inferior conjunction on the 3rd of June. After that, it will reappear in the morning sky. Okay, so without Venus in the sky, are we going to be bereft of planets? Well, obviously not. We've got the other uh, big planets now starting to move into position. Mars is brightening and telescopically, its apparent size is increasing. However, there's a bit of a problem with it because it's sort of edging towards the east. And that means that its view in the sky is currently rather difficult. It's quite a tricky thing to see just in the morning sky before sunrise. It's moved into the sort of twilight area, so it's not very well positioned. On the 31st of May, Mars shines at magnitude naught, which is a brightness increase of 1.4 times over its appearance on the 1st of May. Through the eyepiece, Mars is now 9 seconds across and appears 84% illuminated on the 31st of May. A 44% illuminated waning crescent moon lies 3.3 degrees to the south of Mars on the 15th of May. The gas giant Jupiter is a bright morning planet, which currently appears close to dimmer Saturn. On the 1st of May, it shines at magnitude minus 2.2, brightening slightly to minus 2.4 at the end of the month. A 73% lit waning gibbous moon lies nearby on the morning of the 12th of May. Saturn is a morning object outshone by Jupiter, which lies to its west. The moon appears nearby on the mornings of the 12th and 13th of May. And throughout May, Saturn shines around magnitude plus 0.8. So it's fairly obvious uh, to the naked eye. It appears with a slightly off-white colour to it. The ice giants Uranus and Neptune, well, they're not very well placed during May, so we'll forget those for the moment. So let's now uh, move on to any special events which are happening. On the 1st of May, the mysterious form of Plato's hook should be visible on the moon during the early afternoon. Now, Plato's hook is its a bit contentious, actually, what it is. It's the shadow of uh, a peak on the rim of the crater Plato on the moon. Now that peak, it's called the Gamma Peak, casts a shadow which passes onto the floor of Plato. And reports, early reports, suggested that the shadow appears curved. Now, it's not known whether that is the actual shadow which was being described. There is another mechanism uh, which can create a curving shadow there. And uh, if you turn to our challenge, section in the magazine. You can read all about it there. So that's something to uh, look out for. The annual Eta Aquarid meteor shower reaches its peak on the morning of the 7th of May, but this is a tricky shower. It's got a, a decent zenith Lowry rate of 28 meters per hour, but the radiant is really low down in U the UK sky. And this year we're going to have the moon up as well. So it's going to sort of wash out a lot of the Eta Aquarids. On the 20th of May, there's a good opportunity to see the shadow of the outer Galilean moon Callisto transiting across Jupiter's disk. The event starts at 0030 UT with the mid-transit at 0230 UT and the event ends at 0413 UT. So that's quite an interesting thing to see if you have a telescope. On the 21st, it's the turn of Ganymede to cast its shadow on Jupiter's disk. And that transit starts at 0240 UT, mid-transit 0428, the whole thing ending at 0555. 
If you've been following the comet C2017 T2 Pan stars, that appears very close to the galaxy pair M81 and M82 in Ursa Major on the 24th of May. Now through uh, May, we also have the opportunity to see another comet. Now this one's quite exciting because it underwent a, uh, an outburst in January of this year, brightening by about a hundred times. Now the estimates for how bright this particular comet is going to get actually puts it within the realm of naked eye visibility and it may get very bright, may actually get into negative magnitudes. Now there's uncertainty on that so you know you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But the comet in question is comet C2019 Y4 Atlas and uh, if it's going to follow its predicted uh, magnitude brightening it should approach about fourth magnitude mid-month. Now it could be higher than that if some of the estimates are to be believed or because it's a comet it could be lower than that but it's a comet which is going to be heading down from Camelopardalus on the 1st of May down into Perseus. Now that's not particularly well placed from the UK I think the best guide if you want to see it is probably to use the star Capella because it appears to the right of Capella around sort of mid-month. It's more or less in between Capella, that's the brightest star in Auriga, uh, and Murfak, which is the brightest star in Perseus. So it's going to head down and get closer and closer to the horizon as the, um, as the month goes on. So we're going to lose it towards the very end of the month when it could actually be quite a bright object. But again, as I say, take it with a pinch of salt because you never can tell exactly what comets are going to do. Okay, and as we're heading into the summer months, of course, towards the end of May, we're going to wander into noctilucent cloud season. Now, noctilucent clouds are the highest clouds on planet Earth. They exist in a very thin layer in the mesosphere, about 82 kilometers up, and they're typically seen from late May through to early August. The best months are really June and July. Now, the reason why they can be seen at night is because they're so high up, even though the sun is below the horizon for us on the ground, they're still high enough to be able to see the sun. So they catch the sun's rays, they reflect sunlight, and they appear to shine against the dark sky. Now last year we had some very good displays of noctilucent clouds, so it's going to be interesting to see what the 2020 uh, season has in offer. Now if they're there, they're typically visible say about 90 to 120 minutes after sunset, low above the northwest horizon, and typically a similar time before sunrise, low above the northeast horizon. If you get a really bright display, it'll track from the northwest through north and into the northeast. And that's because it's basically following the position of the sun below the horizon. Okay, so what about the stars? Well, the stars are slightly challenged at this time of year because the period of true darkness is shrinking. The plough, or saucepan, whatever you want to call it, is virtually overhead, and that paves the way to locate a number of interesting galaxies. If you extend a line from Fecta, which is Gamma Ursa Majoris, through Dube, Alpha Ursa Majoris, and keep the line going again, that will bring you in about the same distance to the pair of galaxies M81 and M82. That's where comet C2017 T2 Pan stars is passing around the 24th of May. Both of those galaxies are visible with a small telescope and they're quite interesting because they show completely different shapes. You've got M81, uh, which shows a sort of uh, elliptical, as a, an elliptical smudge, and M82, which looks more like a, a line, if you like. It's, it, M82 is known as the cigar galaxy. It's, it's quite thin in the sky, and it's quite interesting to look at them in the same field of view and just compare their shapes. The saucepan's handle leads to more galactic treasures, um, but first, if you stop off at the second star in from the end of the handle, that's Mizar, or Zeta Ursa Majoris. And if you look at it closely with your eyes, you should be able to make out a fainter companion called Alcor, really close to it. Now this used to be regarded as a test of eyesight, 
but it isn't actually that difficult, which is quite interesting. Um, just have a look at those two, all oh, that star, Mars are, and see whether you can see Alcor, which is very close to it. Together, those stars are known as the horse and rider. Now, if you have a telescope and you can look at that pair of stars, you'll see that Mizar is itself a close double. And remarkably, specialist equipment also reveals the stars of each uh, of the stars in the, the Mizar pair is also a double again. And we now know that Alcor is also a double. So that brings the total count of stars there to six. So that's a sextuplet system. The star at the end of the saucepan's handle is Alcade, Eta Ursa Majoris, and that can help you to locate another very famous galaxy known as the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. That galaxy lies 3.5 degrees southwest of Alcade, and a small telescope shows it as a smudge with a smaller smudge nearby. The larger smudge is the Whirlpool Galaxy itself, and the smaller one is NGC. 5195, a dwarf galaxy undergoing gravitational interaction with the whirlpool. Imagine the handle of the saucepan as the arc of a circle. Now, if you can do that, if you can imagine where the center of the circle would be, that's marked by the star Cor Caroli, or Alpha Canum Venaticorum. And that's the brightest star in Canes Venatici, the hunting dogs. It's quite an interesting constellation because there's not really much to it. Um, how you can make hunting dogs out of what are basically two stars there is quite beyond me. But Cor Caroli is the main star and the second star is Chara. So basically in the sky it's just a line and that's supposed to represent two hunting dogs. Okay, with a good imagination perhaps. So if you rotate the core Caroli Chara line 90 degrees clockwise around Chara, and where core Caroli would end up, so it's a beautiful red star, which is called Y Canum Venaticorum, or La Superba. If you perform the same trick, but this time rotating the line anti-clockwise about core Caroli, the Chara end ends up at M63, which is also known as the Sunflower Galaxy. And that's a beautiful spiral galaxy, which is presented to us through a telescope as a wide ellipse. Its arms appear heavily mottled with a largest telescope, or if you're into imaging, try and take a photograph of it, and you'll see that it's sort of mottled all the way around, which gives the appearance of the seeds at the center of a sunflower. Now the plough, or saucepan, however you want to describe it, can also be used for finding the brightest nighttime star in the northern half of the sky, and that is Arcturus. So to do that, all you have to do is imagine the handle of the saucepan being extended away from the pan. If you continue that arc round, follow the arc, then you'll end up at Arcturus. Once you've found, imagine a line from Cor Caroli to Arcturus and use a telescope to view the region close to the midpoint of that line. Here you'll find the magnificent globular cluster Messier 3. It's one of the finest in the northern half of the sky. In fact, it's a, it's a real beauty. If you've got a telescope and you look at it through the eyepiece of the telescope, it just is quite stunning. And it's Interesting to wonder why it doesn't get as much press as, say, M13, which is the great globular cluster in Hercules. I guess the reason is mainly down to the fact that it's harder to locate. So that trick of using Cor Caroli and Arcturus is probably the best way to find it. If you do that and you see that beautiful globular cluster, just take your time with it and look at it and just take in all those faint stars you've got there. A good trick with globulars is also to increase the power. So start off with a wide field eyepiece and then gradually up the power to get closer and closer. At some point you'll probably go too far and it'll just look like a blurry smudge. But if you then wind it back a bit, that'll give you your optimum view of that most beautiful object. So there's plenty to look out for in the May sky. Keep a lookout for that comet C2019 Y4 Atlas, and fingers crossed it puts on a display for us. Thank you very much, and hopefully next time I'll be back with my colleague, Dr. Paul Abel. Thanks. <laughs>